Hey guys, it's Kat. So, I'm a writer. I like to write. I also love to read. As you should know if you have spent any time at all on this channel. I constantly mention my love for books. So, I'm gonna tell you guys a story. Yay! This is Agree in the Brave by Cornelia Funk. Funk. Funka? Funk? H however you pronounce that word right there. Now, this is an amazing book that I just loved pieces. So, there are how many chapters in this thing? Is there a index? Give me a moment. Alright, so there's no index. They don't number the chapters. But there's 212 pages. So this is going to be a couple parts. But, see the thickness of this book? I like to read books that are... Hang on a moment. Oh, wait, I've got one right here. Ah, no, not on my CD. Okay, I'm going to move that. Alrighty. So, thickness of a grain the brave. This is my... The... The Complete Sherlock Holmes Volume 2. I like this book. And what is that that I'm using as a bookmark? Is this a knitting pattern? Have I been... Oh, okay. I haven't been looking for that one. Great. So, back on topic. And so, so yeah, I like thick books. Thick books are good. So, this is going to take a couple parts. If I can ever actually get started reading the book. Contents. How did I miss you? Oh well. <clears throat> the Castle in the Woods, aka Chapter One. The rain woke up because something was crawling over her face. Something with a lot of legs. She opened her eyes, and there it was, sitting right on the end of her nose. A fat black spider. The green was scared stiff of spiders. Sisyphus, she whispered in a trembling voice. Wake up, Sisyphus, shoo that spider away. The cat raised his furry gray face from a green stomach, blinked, stretched, and snapped up the spider from the end of her nose. One gulp, and it was gone. Did I say anything about eating it? A grain wiped cat spit off her cheek and pushed Sisyphus off her bed. Spider on my nose, she muttered, throwing back the covers. The day before my birthday, too. That's not a good omen. Barefoot, she went over to the window and looked out. The sun was already high in the sky above Pimpernel Castle. The tower cast its shadow over the courtyard. Doves were preening on the battlements, and a horse snorted down in the stables. Pimpernel Castle had belonged to Agraine's family for more than 300 years. Her mother's great-great-great-great-great-grandfather had built it. There may have been a few more greats than that. Agraine wasn't sure. The castle was not large. It had only a single tower, which leaned over sideways, and the walls weren't much more than two feet thick, but Agraine thought it was the most beautiful castle in the world. Wildflowers grew between the paving stones in the courtyard. Swallows nested under the roof of the tower in spring, and water snakes lived under the blue water lilies in the great castle moat. Two stone lions, high on a ledge above the gateway, guarded the castle. When a grain scraped sorry, the moss off their manes, they purred like cats. But if a stranger came near, they bared their stony teeth and roared. They sounded so terrifying that even the wolves in the nearby forest hid. The lions, though, were not the only guardians of Pimpernel. Stone gargoyles looked down from the walls and made, <clears throat> and made terrible faces at any stranger. If you tickled their noses with a dove's feather, they laughed so loud that the bird droppings crumbled off the castle battlements. But their wide mouths could swallow cannonballs, and they crunched up burning arrows as if they were, there were nothing tastier in the world. 
Luckily, however, the gargoyles hadn't had any arrows or cannonballs to eat for a long time. It was many years since Pimpernel Castle had been attacked. Once upon a time, life hadn't been so peaceful. For Agrain's family owned the famous Singing Books of Magic, and many powerful men had wished to own them. Robber knights, dukes, barons, even two kings had attacked Pimpernel to steal the books. But they had all gone away empty-handed, and since Agrain's birth, life had been quiet at Pimpernel. Mmm, just smell that. Agrain put Sisyphus down on the windowsill beside her and took a deep breath of the cool morning air. A delicious smell of wood ash, honey, and vervain met her nostrils, and a shimmering pink glow rose into the sky from the top window of the tower. The magic workshop where Agrain's parents cast their spells lay behind that window, for noble Sir Lamorak and the fair Melisande were the greatest magicians between the Whispering Woods and the Giant's Hills. Why are they working magic so early in the morning? Agrain whispered anxiously into Sisyphus's pointy ear. I don't suppose they've even had breakfast yet. Do you think they're worried my present won't be ready in time? She quickly brushed a few moths off her woolly pants, climbed into them, and put her great-grandfather's chainmail shirt over her head. The grain had worn it ever since she found it in the armory, although it came down to her knees and she had to admit that it wasn't very comfortable. Her big brother, Albert, wanted to be a magician like their parents, but Agrain thought magic was dreadfully boring. Incantations, spells, lists of ingredients for magical powders and potions, learning all that by heart gave her a headache. No, she'd rather be like her great-grandfather Peleus of Pimpernel. He was a knight who fought in tournaments and had adventures from morning till night, if the family stories were to be believed. Albert laughed at her ambition, but that's Big Brothers for you. Now and then, Agrain took her revenge by putting wood lice in his magic coat. Laugh all you like, she said when Albert, F, when Albert teased her. You wait and see. I'll bet you ten of your tame mice I'll win one of the king's tournaments someday. Albert loved his mice, but he accepted Agrain's bet all the same. As for Sir Lamorak and the fair Melisande, they always exchanged worried glances when their daughter came down to breakfast in her male shirt. Her family definitely didn't think much of her plans for the future. Come on, Sisyphus. Agrain buckled up her belt and put the yawning tomcat under her arm. Let's go and do a bit of spying. She ran downstairs to the great hall, passing the portraits of her ancestors, who all looked very glum, and pushed open the big gate leading into the courtyard. It was a lovely, warm day. The scent of flowers filled the air within the high castle walls, mingling with the smell of mouse droppings. Oh, Sisyphus, Sisyphus, said a grain of reproachfully as she carried the cat downstairs with her. If you lay off of Albert's mice for much longer, we'll be treading on them when we cross the courtyard. Couldn't you at least scare them away now and then? Too dangerous, growled the cat, sleepily closing his eyes. Ever since Agrain had sprinkled him with Albert's magic red powder, he'd been able to talk, though he didn't often feel like it. You're just a scaredy cat, said Agrain. Albert may keep threatening to turn you into a dog, but he'd never really do it. He doesn't know how. And even if he did, well, my parents would never let him. Sisyphus yawned in answer and pretended to be asleep as she carried him over to the enchanted tower. The singer single tower of Pimpernel stood right in the middle of the castle courtyard, surrounded by a moat of its own, not as wide as the outer moat, but very deep. The Grand's ancestors had survived many a siege in this tower, because you could barricade yourself inside even if the rest of the castle had been captured. The only way across the moat was over a very narrow bridge that could be raised in times of war. A dragon had once lived underneath. He hadn't been very big, but in the family chronicles he was known as the Night Eater. The grain often wished he was still there, because now the underside of the bridge was infested with spiders. They made her knees shake when she went to visit her parents in their workshop. And because Albert knew that, he sometimes drew the bridge up just a bit so that she had to jump the gap. He'd done that today. The grain cursed him, but she jumped, with Sisyphus under her arm. Quiet now, she whispered as she crept over the bridge, her knees still all spidery weak. No mewing, no hissing, no purring, nothing. You know Albert has ears like a bat. 
The cat just gave her a scornful look as she put him down outside the tower door. Of course, he could prowl around much more quietly than she could, but Green did her best. A few startled bats fluttered to meet them when she climbed the endless staircase on tiptoe. There were hundreds up in the rafters, and Albert's tame mice sat on almost every step, but Sisyphus acted as if he didn't even see them. The heavy oak door of the workshop was painted with magical signs, and the door handle was a small brass serpent that liked to bite strangers' hands. Agreen cautiously put her ear to the door and listened. She could hear the books of magic singing very indistinctly in their high voices. Sif Sisyphus rubbed against her leg and purred. He wanted his breakfast. What did I tell you? whispered Agreen with irritation, pushing him away. Be quiet! But at that moment the door opened. Just a crack. Just wide enough for Albert to put his head to put his head put his head out. I might have known, he said, smiling his what a silly little sister smile. His nose was smudged with wood ash, and there were two mice in his hair. I was passing here entirely by chance, Agreen snapped at him. I just wanted to ask when we're finally going to have breakfast. Albert's smile widened. You won't find out what you really want to know, he said. Your birthday present has always been a surprise, and it's going to be a surprise this time, too. You go and feed the snakes. Green stood on tiptoe so that she could at least steal a glance into the room over his shoulder, but Albert pushed her back. Go away and play knights in armor, little sister, he said. I'll ring the bell for breakfast when we're ready. Good morning, honey, Agreen heard her mother call inside the magic workshop. Good morning, called her father, Sir Lamarack. Agreen didn't answer. She stuck her tongue out at Albert and climbed down all those stairs again with her head held high. End of chapter one. Water snakes and fencing practice. The water snake's food was in the kitchen, and half a dozen of Albert's mice scurried off the table as the green came in. They'd been at the cheese again, and when Sisyphus pushed his way past Agreen's legs, they trotted past him as calmly as if he were stuffed. One of these days I'll catch them, thought Agreen, even if Albert does turn me into a spider for it. Albert, what use are brothers? Especially big brothers. The same old whispering every year, the same old hush-hush stuff, she said crossly, putting a saucepan over the nibbled cheese to cover it. But they're really going too far this time. They've been up there working magic for five days now. Are they giving me an elephant or what? She poured some milk and water into Sisyphus's bowl, took the bucket of magic leftovers out of the oven, where her mother always left it to hide it from the mice, and carried it into the castle courtyard. Sisyphus followed her with milk on his whiskers. The great drawbridge squealed horribly when a grain let it down. Of course, all this magic, but it never even occurred to anyone to oil the chain. Sisyphus brushed past her legs and put his head over the side of the bridge, looking for his breakfast. The fish in the large outer moat weren't under Albert's protection, and the cat was very fond of fish. It was little short of a miracle that there were still shoals of them left. A grain took a couple of blue-shelled eggs out of the bucket of magic leftovers and threw them in among the water lilies. The water around the flowers began moving at once, as five snakes reached their shimmering heads up to a grain, tongues darting in and out. I'm terribly sorry, she said, leaning down to them, but it's Albert's dry biscuits and blue eggs again today. The entire bucket was full of them. Even a grain had to admit that Albert was quite a talented magician for someone his age, but as soon as he tried to conjure up something edible, he only produced blue eggs, and dry biscuits. However, water snakes aren't choosy, and as usual, they devoured Albert's magical failures with the utmost relish. Meanwhile, a grain wandered to the far end of the bridge and looked across the marshy meadows beyond the castle. Apart from a few rabbits hopping through the grass, nothing stirred in the morning sunlight. A grain sighed. Feeding the snakes every morning, she muttered, dusting the books of magic on Wednesdays and Saturdays, scraping the moss off the stone lion's manes once a week, and once a year a tournament at Dark Rock Castle. 
Nothing exciting ever happens here, Sisyphus. Never, ever. Sighing, she sat down on the side of the bridge next to the cat, and Sisyphus rubbed his gray head against her knee. I'm going to be twelve tomorrow, Sisyphus, the grin went on. Twelve! And I haven't had a single real adventure. How will I ever get to be a famous knight? Saving rabbits from the fox, rescuing squirrels from pine martens? No, saving fish for me, purred Sisyphus, dipping his claws in the water. But this time his scaly prey got away from him. The grain looked up at the stone gargoyles. Some of them were yawning, and the rest were squinting crossly at the fat flies that liked to bask on their noses in the sun. I mean, look at that. Even the gargoyles are bored, she said. I bet they'd like to crunch a few arrows or swallow a cannonball for a change. Sisyphus just shook his head and went on staring patiently at the dark water. Yes, I know, it's silly to wish for that kind of thing. The grain jumped up so suddenly the cat hissed at her angrily. You'll scare the fish away. All you ever think about is food, she snapped, reaching for the empty bucket. I'm gonna die of boredom. You wait and see. Maybe not overnight, but definitely before my next birthday. Sisyphus dipped his paw into the water, and this time he threw a flapping fish up onto the bridge. Learn to work some magic, he growled. I'm not interested in magic. You know that very well, Agrain said. Gloomily, she wandered back to the castle gate. Magic, she muttered, learning the ingredients for potions by heart, magic spells, magic symbols. No thanks, not for me. Pull the drawbridge up again, mewed Sisyphus as he dragged his fish past her. What for, she said. There's no one coming, anyway. Twelve years old she murmured as she made for the armory to the right of the gateway. My great-grandfather was a squire in a royal tournament when he was seven. The door of the armory was always well-oiled. The grain saw to that. Even if her parents didn't think much of weapons and armor, they thought their magic was much better protection. The armory of Pimpernel Castle was still full of swords and suits of armor, shields and lances from the day of her great-grandfather Peleus. He had been an enthusiastic knight, but a terrible horseman, and never won a single tournament because he always fall off, fell off his horse before his opponent had so much as leveled his lance. Egrain often passed the time cleaning rust off his old swords or polishing the shields that bore his coat of arms until they shone. I was born at the wrong time, that's all, she muttered as she picked up one of his dented shields. Yes, that's what it is. Her parents didn't like her to use the real swords, but very likely they'd be shut up in their workshop for some time yet. So Egrain chose a blade that looked fairly like the play sword her father had made her by magic, stuck it in her belt, and put a helmet with a crest like a silver bird on her head. Unfortunately, it was too big for her, but it looked good all the same. Then she took the magical leather dummy off his stand. Albert and her parents had conjured him up for her eighth birthday. When a grain blew three times into the dummy's face, he stood upright, adjusted his sword belt, and stalked into the courtyard after her. Sisyphus put his ear back and hissed as the leathery creature marched out of the armory. Oh, come on, a grain told him. You know he's not going to hurt you, and it's not as if I can practice fencing with you. The leather man, limbs creaking, followed her up the stairs leading to the battlements above the castle gate. Sisyphus gloomily dropped a well-gnawed fishbone and leaped up the stairs after them. While the cat made himself comfortable on the warm wall, the leather dummy leaned against the battlements, waiting. But a grain clambered up on top of the wall and looked around. The sky was as blue as forget-me-nots. Only a few white clouds were drifting toward her from the whispering woods. It was such a clear day that if you looked west, you could see all the way to the lands of the one-eyed duke who is said to hunt dragons and unicorns all day, every day. The nearest village lay on one of the hills to the south. It was a long ride to get there, but on days like this, you could see the cottage roof rooftops between the trees. To the east, however, the five round towers of Dark Rock Castle rose to the sky. Dark Rock was ten times bigger than Pimpernel, and its mistress, the old baroness, loved just two things in life, horses and spicy mead. Nothing to do, murmured a grain. Nothing at all. This is really more than I can stand. She leaned forward. Hello. Who 
Looks like the Baroness has a new banner. What coat of arms is that? Oh well, it probably just shows a barrel of spicy mead. With a sigh, she jumped down from the wall and put the point of her sword to the leather dummy's chest. On guard, leather knight, she cried, closing her visor. You sawed off my unicorn's horn and you'll pay dearly for it. The leather man drew his sword and planted himself squarely in front of her. As usual, he parried her sword strokes with the utmost elegance, and soon a grin was so hot in her chainmail that she ran down to the well in her courtyard in the courtyard. She was just pouring a bucket of water over her head when the stone lions above the gate began to roar. End of chapter. And because I mean that's as far as we're going today. There will be another part soon, and I won't leave you on that cliffhanger for very long. But you're going to be stuck on it for a little while, because I'm mean like that. So I hope you enjoyed the first bit of uh, the first two chapters of A Grain the Brave. It's a really good book. I really like this book. So, yeah. Bye.